Good morning, and uh, welcome uh, to our regular board agenda meeting. Uh, and welcome to those who are watching us via uh, live stream. Um, Commissioner Gordon, would you lead us in the flag salute, please? Thank you. Public notice, please. Adequate public notice has been given pursuant to the Open Publics Meeting Act. Notice have been posted at the board's office and have been delivered to the Department of State and to newspapers of broad circulation within the state. Thank you. And now the roll call. Commissioner Holden. Here. Commissioner Solomon. Here. Commissioner Shivakula. Here. Commissioner Gordon. Here. President Fiorliso. Here. And what is our next meeting? Our next regular board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, February 5th, 2020 at 10 a.m. State House Annex Committee Room 11. Thank you. Um, we will be having an executive session today and we're going to be uh, looking at uh, or discussing two items in executive session. Uh, we'll be uh, discussing uh, 8G and miscellaneous item A. I also want to make note of the fact that item 9B will be deferred to our next meeting, 9B. So if you're here for 9B, you can go home. So will the Attorney General please read why we're going into executive session? That's yes, you, thank Michael? you. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. We'll be moving into an executive session this morning on two matters as identified by the president. This is pursuant to the exception to the Open Public Meetings Act at New Jersey Statute 10 colon 4 dash 12 B7. With regard to agenda item 8G, that is pending litigation in which the BPU is in fact a party and it's also subject to attorney client privilege with regard to agenda item 9A, that is contract negotiation and confidentiality. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the board will be taking action on those two items in regular session. I would estimate that the executive session should last between 30 and 40 minutes. Uh, do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. We're in executive session, thank you. We got back here a little earlier, and uh, we're back in regular session. And I just have um, a couple of uh, comments uh, before we get into the agenda. And uh, first is BGS is coming up, uh, and it begins on January 31st. And uh, there will be a special board meeting sometime during the week of February 3rd. Uh, we will certainly notice it and, and give as much advance notice as we possibly can uh, so that everyone can adjust their schedule. Um, but it will be sometime the week of the 3rd of February. Um, I'm also, I guess, kind of excited at the fact that on Monday, uh, January 27, the governor will be making a, an announcement regarding the release of the New Jersey Energy Master Plan. I think uh, we're proud to unveil, unveil uh, New Jersey's 2019 Energy Master Plan. Uh, it's intended uh, to set forth a strategic vision for the production, distribution, consumption, and conservation of energy in the state of New Jersey. The state's energy policy reflects, I believe, the full scope of New Jersey's current energy sector, as well as its future. As the state expands its green economy, there will be new jobs, industries, and increased workforce development, 
providing, I believe, exciting new opportunities for New Jersey's residents and business community. I want to note that there was tremendous interagency cooperation uh, in creating the Energy Master Plan. And I want to thank our colleagues, uh, of all the staff members, especially our friends and colleagues at the Department of Environmental Protection, for all of the hard work that was put into this. The next step, and there are other agencies and uh, departments that were also involved, and uh, it was really a um, almost a universal effort by the state uh, to produce this energy master plan. And I hope it uh, meets everyone's expectations. Um, the next step will be to implement uh, what the energy master plan suggests, which will provide a pathway uh, to 100% clean energy by 2050. So we continue to move forward to make New Jersey greener. Also, as many of you know, this past Friday, Governor Murphy signed a bill establishing goals and incentives for the increased use of electric vehicles in the state of New Jersey. This bill, which will prove crucial uh, to the governor's goal of achieving 100% renewable energy by 2050, will allow individuals to receive rebates of up to $5,000 on new electric vehicles. The bill also granted the Board of Public Utilities the authority to establish an incentive program for the purchase and installation of in-home electric vehicle charging equipment. We will have awarded, uh, we have awarded the contract rather to develop and administer New Jersey's EV incentive program to the Center for Sustainable Energy and we are eager to move forward. This bill will provide one of the most comprehensive programs any state in the nation has put in place to electrify its transportation system, which accounts for 40% of the carbon that goes into our air. And we are very excited to see more electric vehicles in the state of New Jersey. I assure you that we are ready to hit the ground running, or should I say driving and plan to move expeditiously to launch the electric vehicle rebates. And this will also, as we move forward in this direction too, one of the most important aspects is the infrastructure that is necessary to support the electric vehicle industry. And um, we don't want people to have rage anxiety. Range anxiety is a detriment to people buying electric vehicles. Already on the Turnpike and the Parkway, there are 76 public charging stations. We're going to ensure the fact as we move forward with this program that more and more charging stations become available, and uh, which hopefully will relieve that anxiety. So I think there are a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, here in the state of New Jersey as we continue to move forward to not only clean our air, but to mitigate the effects of climate change. And we're seeing more and more of our states in the United States joining the crusade to mitigate climate change. What we need is efforts by governments all over the world. And, uh, and that's what I'm sure is being worked on by a number of groups. So I want to thank everyone who was involved um, in the implementation and, and, and getting that legislation through. It, uh, there were a lot of variations to it, but it's certainly something that uh, we, uh, we applaud, or I applaud. And uh, I want to thank Chance Likens for his expertise in helping to get this through. And, uh, and so on. So it's, it's really important for all of us, particularly our children. Do any other commissioners wish to make any statement? Yes, sir.
you're right, and, and we have to, all levels of government have to lead by example. And we have to show people that there are dire situations in front of us if we don't take action. And, uh, and, and the action we're taking, uh, as far as vehicles and transportation is concerned, uh, is to electrify. Any other comments? Yes. I just want to build on what Commissioner Gordon has said, and that by incentivizing fleets, this is a way that people who cannot yet afford to buy an electric vehicle, even with the incentives, um, can still participate because of the cleaner air that will be provided through these fleets and that are owned by counties, local governments, state government. So I think it's a great, great move. Good. Okay. Uh, Madam Secretary, the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. President. On the following consent agenda items, item 1A, 2A, 7A, and 9A. So moved. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shibakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fiorliso? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go on to the regular agenda. <clears throat> Uh, there are no items to be considered under audits. That brings us to energy and 2A. Stacy. Good morning, commissioners. Agenda item 2A relates to a December 9th, 2019 petition filed by the state's electric distribution companies requesting recovery of FERC approved changes in firm transmission service related charges. Through a series of orders, the board has authorized the EDCs to modify their basic generation service rates to reflect changes in their transmission charges resulting from FERC approved changes. There are several allocations included in the tech charges that have not received a final FERC order, including the Con Ed wheel reallocation and HTP and Linden VFT. In its orders, the board authorized the EDCs to begin collecting these charges and track such collections until the issuance of final FERC orders in the matters. The EDCs requested that the changes in rates be effective for service rendered on or after January 1st and have represented that suppliers would be compensated subject to the terms and conditions of the applicable supplier master agreements. Based on the allocation of the tech costs for the EDCs and the respective allocation among customer classes, the monthly bill for a residential customer using 650 KWH per month will change by the following amounts. A decrease of five cents for ACE, an increase of 13 cents for JCPNO, an increase of $2.85 for PSE and G, and an increase of 33 cents for Rockland. Consistent with past recommendations, staff recommends the board approve the changes to the BGS rates requested by the EDCs, resulting from the FERC approved changes to the tax, the derived network integration transmission service rate for PSE and G, and the EL05 121 charges, effective February 1st. With, so, res whoops, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With respect to the allocate reallocations derived from the FERC orders, which are still subject to ongoing challenges, staff recommends the EDCs be authorized to collect these costs and track the collections until receipt of a final FERC order. For the remaining tech changes, staff recommends the EDCs be authorized to compensate suppliers subject to the this terms and conditions of the SMAs. Staff further recommends the EDCs be directed to file revised tariffs by February 1st. So moved. <laughs> Questions? <clears throat> I just have a question, maybe it's appropriate. Uh, the, under the uh, open access transmission tariff, do they include a supplemental transmission also? It's just the reliability related. No, there's supplement, the supplemental projects are, are in the OATT as well. Also as well, okay. Yes. And uh, of these projects that you have indicated, are, are there any supplementals? Yeah, there would be a lot of supplemental in there. They're all in there um, and the they're okay. rolled into the formula rates. So, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Any other questions? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fioliso? Yes. Uh, 2B at JCPNL matter. Yeah. On December 27th, the state's four electric distribution companies filed a joint petition requesting recovery of FERC approved changes in transmission service related charges related to the formula rate filing made by JCPNL. 
In the petition, the EDCs requested that the changes become effective on January 1st, 2020, and also requested that suppliers be compensated for the change effective January 1st, and have confirmed that the suppliers would be compensated subject to the terms and conditions of the applicable supplier master agreements. On December 20th, FERC issued an order that accepted the proposed tariff revisions, suspending them for a nominal period to become effective January 1st, 2020, subject to refund, and established a hearing and settlement judge procedures. Based on the allocation of the tech costs for the EDCs and their respective allocation among service classes, the monthly bill for a residential customer using 650 kWh per month will change by the following amounts. No change for ACE or Rockland, an increase of 51 cents for JCPNL, and an increase of one cent for PSE&G. Consistent with past recommendations, since the matter is still pending at FERC, staff recommends the board authorize the EDCs to collect from customers effective February 1st, 2020, the cost associated with the petition, and track the collections until receipt of a final FERC order in the matter. Staff further recommends the board direct the EDCs to file revised tariffs by February 1st. So moved. Second. Comments? Questions? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fiorlisa? Yes. Uh, 2C regarding a PS e g tax adjustment? Correct. On September 26, 2019, PS filed a petition seeking approval of electric and gas rate changes associated with the electric and gas tax adjustment credits to reset them for 2020. In the petition, the company proposed an ETAC refund for calendar year 2020 of approximately 87.7 million, which when added to the estimated December 31st over-collected balance of 8.2 million, resulted in a total proposed refund to customers of approximately 95.9 million. For the GTAC, the refund to customers proposed by the, the utility is approximately 145.6 million for calendar year 2020 which when added to the estimated over-collected balance at December 31st of 10.4 million, resulted in a total proposed refund of 156 million. While the company proposed overall decreases for the electric and gas customers, PSE&G's contract service gas rate class will see an increase in their rates due to the amount of therms utilized by this rate class. The parties have executed a stipulation requesting the board approve the changes in the tax on a provisional basis subject to refund with interest to allow the party sufficient time to complete the review of the petition. As a result of the stipulation, the annual bill impact on a typical residential electric customer would be a decrease of $6.28, and the annual bill impact on a typical gas customer would be a decrease of $4.82. Staff recommends the board issue an order approving the stipulation and directing PS to file revised tariffs by February 1st. So moved. Questions? Comments? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fiorlisa? Yes. Uh, 2D, Rockland Electric? Uh, on May 3rd, 2019, Rockland Electric filed a petition for approval of an increase in its operating revenues of approximately $19.9 million. Among other things, the company also sought board approval of return on equity of 10.4%, the implementation of new depreciation rates, and a prudency review of its storm hardening program investments and its AMI program implementation. The matter was subsequently transmitted to the Office of Administrative Law and assigned to ALJ Jones. Through the course of the proceeding, Rockland updated its request to include actual information through the end of the test year which reflected an updated revenue requirement of 20.3 million. Rate Council submitted direct testimony in this matter and Rockland submitted rebuttal testimony in response to Rate Council. Throughout the course of the proceeding, the parties held numerous discovery and settlement conferences and subsequently executed a stipulation which was approved by ALJ Jones. Some key features of the stipulation are a settlement revenue requirement of $12 million, an ROE of 9.5% with a capital structure of 48.32% equity and 51.68% debt, the four-year amortization of several items, and a modification to Rockland storm reserve amount and criteria for deferred storm costs. 
Stipulation also reflects a change in the residential customer charge to $5.41, including taxes. As a result of the stipulation, a typical residential customer using 925 KWH per month will see an annualized monthly increase of approximately $10.08, or 6.1%. Staff recommends the board issue an order approving the initial decision and stipulation and directing Rockland to file revised tariffs by February 1st. So moved. Second. Questions? Comments? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holton? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fioliso? Yes. Uh, 2E brings us into the world of FERC. Yes. That's like the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Feels like that sometimes. Um, so indeed, uh, good morning, commissioners. <laughs> Item 2E um, morning. is a matter that was filed at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. Indeed, yesterday, staff filed a request for rehearing and clarification of the commission's December 19th order, um, re-establishing a, or establishing a replacement rate for the PJM capacity uh, market. I personally want to thank the commissioners for trusting me and my staff um, to undertake this request for rehearing and clarification. Um, personally, thank you for trusting me in that. And I would also like to recognize the contributions that were made from Abe, Joe, Emily, and Paul in the drafting and review of this filing. And also to recognize the significant contributions of the Assistant Attorney Generals, Jeremy and David, as well as our Deputy Attorney Generals, Paul and uh, Darren in the drafting of this. And so if you're keeping track, that's eight attorneys on one filing. And we didn't kill each other, so you know maybe it is the Twilight Zone. <laughs> At the government rate. <laughs> um, this filing is over 50 pages and nearly 300 footnotes. It was quite a uh, Herculean task to get it out, but um, we do feel very strongly that this well serves the board as well as the state of New Jersey. As a matter of background, this proceeding originated out of complaints filed by Calpine and a variety of other merchant generators in 2016. It was then ultimately consolidated with a tariff filing that was made by PJM in 2018. Um, all of those proposed replacement rates that were put forward by PJM and the Calpine complainants were rejected in an order dated June 29th of 2018. And in that order, FERC completed the first prong of its Section 206 requirement um, under the Federal Power Act. In that June 2018 order, FERC declared the existing capacity market structure to be unjust and unreasonable for failing to account for state subsidies in the market structure. Those state subsidies of interest to New Jersey are specifically our renewable portfolio standard, our offshore wind renewable energy credits or certificates, excuse me, and the zero emissions certificates for nuclear units. Um, as well as a variety of other programs, but those are the top three. Um, at that time, the board timely filed a request for rehearing, which was presented to this board and, and approved. And that rehearing remains outstanding. So 50% of FERC's action is still held up in limbo and pending uh, appellate review. This order that was issued a year and a half later on December 19th of 2019 establishes the second prong of FERC's obligation and it's the replacement rate. So once they identified that the existing rate was unjust and unreasonable, they have an affirmative obligation to put a new rate in place. And that's what this December 19th order purports to do. However, it's staff's position and as stated in our request for rehearing and clarification that FERC has really gone entirely too far. This is a jurisdictional overstep where FERC is supplanting its view of what the generation resource portfolio should be for that of the state of New Jersey. And therefore, we have made a variety of arguments regarding the fact that this is unlawful under the Federal Power Act, which reserves generation facility choices exclusively to the states. In addition, 
it is our view that this order fails under both the Federal Power Act and the Administrative Procedure Act because it is arbitrary, capricious, unjust, and unreasonable. And we put forward in the request for rehearing and clarification a variety of arguments to support um, that ultimate position. We also argue that this does um, kind of have implications for New Jersey BPU's due process rights because, of course, this is only 50% of the equation, and the other 50% is still tied up in the rehearing request that's been told for over a year. Um, this is of particular consequence as the governor is seeking to achieve his um, energy master plan objective of 100% clean energy by 2050. Therefore, staff has made these arguments and filed them yesterday at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and we are asking that the board ratify them at this time. So moved. Second. I don't think we can overstate the importance of uh, this submission to FERC, a submission that uh, hopefully will gain their attention. We also had a teleconference call with OPSI, the Organization of PJM States, and they have also submitted a request for a rehearing. Many other states within the PJM footprint are also submitting individual petitions, just as we are today. Potentially, this can harm, and if I'm saying anything incorrect, Cynthia, just jump in. Potentially, this can harm the initiatives that we have put into effect, or are putting into effect, as far as clean energy and renewable energy is concerned can have a profound effect on the cost of these programs. We don't anticipate that initially it will have an effect, but as we go down the road two or three years, it can have a profound effect. So we are fighting, and I think that's the word, the federal energy Regulatory Commission for what we believe to be an infringement on state rights. We decide the generation in the state of New Jersey, not the FERC. And they have put their foot in something that frankly, in my opinion, they have no business to do. So this, this could wind up going through the court system right up to the top, right up to the Supreme Court, because it is a state right issue and they have overstepped their bounds. We've mentioned before at previous meetings and so on that for the most part, the FERC has been ineffective over the past few years. Don't have quorums, don't have a full contingent of commissioners on board, um, delays upon delays of getting rulings. It has not been an easy job dealing with them. We also had a meeting with PJM, who I think from that meeting is very supportive of the states within their footprint. And we were told that they would probably be submitting a petition for rehearing also. So there are a lot of players in the game here to try to push back that FERC ruling. We'll certainly keep you all up to date because it is vital and important to our programs here in the state of New Jersey and we're not going to give up easily. Any other comments? Yes, sir.
state and uh, may well go to the Supreme Court. So to put a document like this together in such a compressed time frame, I know is a major effort. And I want to thank you for And And one other thing to add to that, uh, Commissioner, so well written. So congratulations to everyone who put a pen to that because it was one of the best things I've read, frankly. Any other comments? Oops. Okay, I got all excited there and the chair fell. I, was, I want to add that it's absolutely superlative work and it's worth every attorney that was involved, but I know your hand was heavily on top of this and uh, certainly as a keeper, with all of the references, um, footnotes are just rich with information. Um, I, if I were the person on FERC, I'd say, we did what? <laughs> and uh, clearly, uh, as uh, President Fiorelliso said, this is an overreach by FERC. Um, they don't realize the consequences of what their intentions may have been versus the consequences they have put on individual states. It's not a collective for just PJM. But particularly, I'm concerned um, that there's no consideration, actually, as a disregard of the reliability benefits of some of our resources, in particular, the zero emission credits that we approved for um, nuclear fleet, which runs about, what, 94% of the time in the state. Um, that's a real concern, to lose that kind of level of reliability. So, as well as, our re renewable port portfolio standard and the offshore wind it makes it very difficult to carry out a state's public policy. We're not saying we all have to do the same thing, but let the states have their rights. I, al <clears throat> I also enjoyed reading uh, the uh, brief over the weekend. It was uh, very rich indeed. Um, uh, regardless of what uh, happens going forward, you know, it's still something as a board we're going to have to deal with. You know, certainly over the years in the past, I was just listening to a uh, webinar on the history of, you know, markets, and certainly there have been benefits to uh, the forming of the RTOs, uh, especially in terms of lowering emissions and uh, especially cost. And we are going, you know, regardless of how the FERC acts or how others act, we as a collective, whether it's New Jersey, the other states that have uh, similar issues, are gonna have to c come up with some way to have markets that give us the benefits that we're looking for in terms of cost and efficiency and reliability and come up with a construct, perhaps come up with a construct that works for us here in New Jersey. So uh, I don't think we can sit idly by and hope that somebody's gonna fix this for us. You know, we might have to get imaginative in, you know, our approach and the approach of others. And, you know, that hasn't gone without precedent in other states in terms of how they've had to deal with their um, um, <clears throat> clean energy uh, agendas. So um, I would recommend that uh, we continue to think outside the box uh, in terms of maybe some of the approaches that we would uh, use to address this issue from a cost and reliability standpoint going forward. Thank you. You know, uh, now that the Super Bowl is around the corner and uh, Cynthia became uh, playing uh, um, umpire referee and he, she threw the flag and said, replay, third down. And that's what this re-hearing re is all about. You realize you were a football player. I am not here. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, the interesting thing about uh, the federal government, you know, FERC, is that uh, they are lacking imagination and uh, they're not, instead of being a catalyst for change and innovation, and they would like to go back. Uh, that's very sad. You know, United States is built on innovation and technological advances where uh, uh, renewable energy is providing a, a forum for developing such technologies and um, also trampling on the state's rights in this case, uh, trying to rule out they won't, because they can do it and they are doing it, which is wrong. And they're ignoring the wildfires in California, uh, Australia, which is very sad that uh, 
more than one billion animals were killed. And uh, people are, you know, Australia, Australian government has not paid attention to the climate change issue. And uh, people, animals and uh, eco ecology is suffering from that. So what we, uh, uh, I want to congratulate you, Cynthia, and your, all your colleagues who have come up with this. Uh, uh, but I think uh, we have to stand up and uh, speak for the right thing, speak for the justice. And uh, the federal government, FERC, single-handedly cannot take our rights away from us. Thank you. As John Paul Jones said, we have not yet begun to fight. Any other comments? Don't give, Don't give up the ship either, right. Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fioliso? Yes. That brings us down to 2F, New Jersey Natural Gas. Ben? Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Item 2F is the petition of New Jersey Natural Gas Company for authority to issue and sell up to $400 million in medium term notes through May 31st of 2022. Bonds sold under this authorization will have a maturity not more than 40 years. The proceeds will be used to retire higher interest rate short term debt to fund future and ongoing construction projects such as the Safety and Facility Enhancement Program 2, the New Jersey RISE Program, and the Southern Reliability Link. Funds will also be used for energy efficiency expenditures, for environmental remediation expenditures, and to fund pension and other post-employment benefit programs. In addition, approval of this petition will also allow the company to engage in various interest rate management transactions to better manage interest costs and to provide protection in the event of unanticipated changes in financial markets. Also as part of the petition, the company requests approval to expand its meter leaseback program. The sale and leaseback program involving meters is a financial tool that can lower borrowing costs for the company. The company indicates that it saves about 50 basis points through this program compared to the cost of capital obtained through traditional or conventional bond sales. New Jersey Natural Gas Company has a high investment grade credit rating, can raise capital on very attractive terms in the financial markets. Company's current credit standing is rated AA3 by Moody's. The Division of Rate Council has reviewed the petition and does not oppose approval and the Office of the Economist does recommend approval of this petition. So moved. Second. Comments, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 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 Dr. Vedral, uh, the medium term notes, meaning how many years is that? Uh, seven years or 10 years, uh, medium term? Um, it's a, a bit of a catch-all phrase. It can typically be used for uh, bonds anywhere from 10 to 40 years in maturity, okay. 10, 20, 30, 40. I wonder why they chose medium term instead of long term. You know, do you have any? Uh... Again, it's just a it's just a term of art phrase. Um, so it provides the flexibility that they can cover all those kind of maturity levels with that. Yep. Any other questions, comments, roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden. Yes. Commissioner Solomon. Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fiorelisa? Yes. Thank you, Ben. Uh, there are no items under cable television to consider, nor telecommunications, nor water. That brings us down to reliability and security. Jim? Item involving our state university. Yes. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I didn't want to give you know crowd Cynthia. That's why I was down there. <laughs> <laughs> so in August of uh, 
219, PSC&G filed a petition with the board requesting authorization to increase the operating pressure on an existing 8-inch pipeline supplying natural gas service to Rutgers University Cogen facility that provides energy to the Bush campus area. The line was originally constructed in 1995, currently operates at a pressure of 245 PSI. The proposal is to increase the operating pressure to two, from 245 to 350 PSI in order to provide a higher flow rate to the three new turbines installed at the Cogen facility by Rutgers. Pipeline serves no other customers, extends 3.2 miles from PSCNG's M&R station on Stelton Road in South Plainfield to the Bush campus on Davidson Road in Piscataway. The pipeline was installed at a minimum depth of five feet, traverses both residential and commercial streets, passing a total of 69 structures of which are within 100 feet, and 61 of those are residential structures. Board staff reviewed the petition, its supporting documents, including maintenance records, pressure test results, and the history of the line. We also performed a visual inspection of the route several times. The pipeline was designed for a maximum allowable operating pressure of 685 PSI and was hydrostatically pressure tested at over 1,000 PSI, and those tests were successful. Under the current proposal, PS will perform another pressure test that we are directing under, with your order, if you approve, and a subsequent leak survey before increasing the pressure to 350 PSI. They also treat this line, although it's not considered transmission, as a transmission structure. Therefore, it is managed by their transmission group and, and looked at with higher risk standards and procedures. On November 4th, we held a public hearing with uh, PSCNG at the Rutgers Bush campus. Uh, all public uh, within 100 feet were, were given certified mail. Uh, it was advertised in the general circulation newspapers and uh, several people attended the hearing. Two individuals asked several questions about safety and we feel those questions were adequately answered and they were satisfied with the utility professional's response. Staff finds that the requested pressure increase to 350 PSI is still significantly below its maximum allowable operating pressure of 685 and well below the previous hydrostatic test results on the line. We also find that the maintenance of the line is in compliance with both federal and state standards. Therefore, we are recommending that you allow the increase and approve the increase on this 8-inch line from 245 PSI to 350. And 50. That's so moved. Question. Second. Questions? Yes. Uh, Jim, I didn't ask you in the, in the, during the briefing. Uh, there's a lot of movement to move from moving from uh, cast iron pipes to uh, uh, PVC types, high pressure PVC pipes. In this case, the new pipes are going to be cast iron? Oh, yeah. No, there's, there's no more cast iron being installed. Oh, it's, it's all, all being removed. Oh, yeah. It's all plastic or right. on the larger lines uh, okay. coated steel. Okay. Yeah. So you also answered the question about the safety, there will be adequate, uh, because you're going through 69 structures, 61 being residential, yes. you have enough safety to shut off uh, in case of... Uh, yes, uh, we, we feel that all the safety measures have been taken, right. um, especially mm -hmm. since there, the risk uh, analysis, uh, risk treatment of this line will be as a transmission line, which is really a higher standard of, of risk surveying and et cetera. So we, we, don't, we don't see a safety issue okay. with it. Thank you. Any other questions? Jim, I, I just wanted to, um, before we take the vote, uh, thank and commend you and your staff. Uh, there was recently a gas issue in Jersey City yeah. where, um, and, and I notified everyone about that, and uh, where some of your personnel was out there until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that doesn't make the newspapers. That's the kind of thing that people don't know about as far as reliability and security is concerned. So. I just wanted to publicly thank you and your staff for another job well done. Yeah, they're very good. They're 24-7, and they, they, they always respond. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fioliso? Yes. No items uh, to consider under customer assistance. That brings us down to clean energy. 
And the first one is 8A, Energy Efficiency Incentive, <coughs> exceeding 500,000. Good morning, Ben. Sorry, I said good morning, commissioners. <laughs> uh, item 8A concerns an application submitted through the Pay for Performance New Construction Program, wherein uh, the applicant Riverwalk C Urban Renewal Associates LLC is requesting board approval uh, for an incentive exceeding $500,000. Uh, the applicant requests an incentive of exactly $598,779.99 for a project that includes uh, an incremental cost of installing proposed energy conservation measures totaling $842,848. Uh, the proposed project location in this case is a new high-rise residential community in West New York, New Jersey. Uh, the new building aims to achieve the LEED Silver Standard by utilizing significantly less energy than a strictly code compliant building would. Uh, the application proposes to install a number of energy conservation measures, including improved wall and roof insulation, uh, LED lighting and controls, high efficiency air to air heat pumps, high efficiency HVAC units, highly efficient elevators, garage demand control, ventilation, and a host of other energy conservation measures. Uh, annually, the project is anticipated to conserve 1,205,535 kilowatt hours of electricity and reduce the building's peak demand by 119.1 kilowatts. Additionally, the proposed project will yield an estimated annual energy cost savings of $103,097. The payback period here without incentives is 8.2 years, and when factoring in the incentives, the payback period is reduced to 2.4 years. And so staff recommends approval of the entire estimated incentive amount. So moved. Second. Questions? Comments? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fairliso? Yes. Brings us to 8B involving the city of New Brunswick. Sarah? Uh, Mr. President, Ron's going to present on this, but with your permission, we're going to give an overview for the next five items. They'll be voted on individually, but they are all related to the same developer, so we're just going to give an overview on all five items. You got it. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Ron. Uh, this is in the matter of a request for a waiver of SREC registration rules at NJAC 14 8 2.4i, and involves New Brunswick uh, Board of Education uh, five projects. On November 26, 2019, GSPP Onyx, New Brunswick LLC, petitioned the board requesting a third extension of two and one half months to the construction completion deadline for its five New Brunswick Board of Ed SRP applications. GSPP had previously petitioned the board for what had been granted to a second extension through November 14, 2019. This petition was not submitted prior to the second extension expiration date. GSPP is now requesting a third extension for the original applications that would extend the deadline to January 31st, 2020. Petitioner supports its request for a third extension with the claim that during the second extension period, it encountered delays from the town of New Brunswick electrical uh, permitting process, which were out of its control. However, on December 6, 2019, GSPP filed five new SRP registration applications for the then expired projects. The SRP team issued acceptance letters for the newly filed applications on December 17, 2019. GSPP is now asking the original five applications be reactivated so they can receive the associated 15-year qualification life for SREX. On January 10, 2020, staff was informed that on December 9th and 11th, GSPP received emails from PSENG stating that the two projects got PTOs or, or permissions to operate effective 12-3-2019 on two of the projects and uh, affected on 12-9-2019 for the three, three other projects. 
Staff recommends that the board find that since the petitioner has refiled an application with the SRP and that the applications have been accepted, that the board will not reactivate the original applications, which now have both expired and been superseded by five new applications. Should the board decide to consider the out of time request for the third extension, staff recommends that it finds that a delayed occasion by a town's permitting process is not sufficient to justify a third extension. We are. Uh, as uh, Sarah mentioned, we're going to take these individually. So let's start with 8B. I'll move this as 8B is the Lincoln Annex Large project. Yes. Questions, comments, roll call. I have a motion to approve staff's recommendation. Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shibakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fioriliso? Yes. That brings us to 8C, also the Lincoln Annex, but the small. Yes. So moved. Second. Comments, questions, roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fioliso? Yes. 8D, uh, New Brunswick Board of Education Solar Project. The administration building, so moved. Yes. Second. Questions? <coughs> Comments? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fioliso? Yes. 8E also involves the Board of Education, but the high school. So moved. Second. Comments? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fiorisa? Yes. And uh, 8F, Board of Education, Middle School. So moved. Second. Comments? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fiorisa? Yes. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. That brings us to 8G which we discussed in executive session. That's correct. And Michael, you're gonna present that? No, as it was discussed in executive session, there's no action required by the board. It was simply review of pending litigation. No vote is necessary. Okay, thank you. So that brings us to 8H, then um, electric vehicles. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, yes. welcome. Good morning, my name is Ashley Lynn Schuntz. Uh, today, this item is to consider staff's recommendation to approve the applications from Lawrence Township and Plainsboro Township, which were submitted to the Clean Fleet Electric Vehicle Incentive Program. Each application seeks grant funding in the amount of $4,000 each to aid in the purchase of one battery electric vehicle. The intent of this program is to give local government authorities the ability to purchase electric vehicles at the state purchase, purchasing contract price while also receiving support from the VPU, providing local government authorities the opportunity to become leaders in the transition to electrified transportation and expand charging infrastructure accessibility. Staff seeks board approval for these applications as well as the authorization for staff to disperse the grants associated with these applications in accordance with VPU procedures. So moved. Second. Questions? Comments? Roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fairliso? Yes. Thank you. Miscellaneous item 9A, which was also discussed in executive session. Maureen? Good morning. <clears throat> At its August 7, 2019 agenda meeting and docket number E0190303038, 
the board directed staff to initiate a comprehensive study of the board's energy assistance programs. Therefore, today, board staff requests authorization to release a request for response, or RFR, to solicit bids for conducting a study and evaluation of the following four programs. The Universal Service Fund, the Fresh Start Program, the Payment Assistance for Gas and Electric Program, and the Temporary Relief for Utility Expenses Program. <clears throat> the study will provide conclusions regarding the effectiveness and efficiency of the programs and also provide recommendations regarding best practices for maximizing accessibility and enrollment, as well as if the programs can be better integrated. If the board authorizes the release of this RFR, staff has the goal of returning to the board with a recommended bidder at the March 25th board meeting. Therefore, uh, staff recommends the board authorize staff to release this request for response. So moved. Questions, comments, roll call. On the motion to approve staff's recommendation pursuant to the discussion in executive session, Commissioner Holden? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Shivakula? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Yes. President Fiorliso? Yes. Thank you, Maureen. Um, as I indicated at the beginning of the meeting, miscellaneous item 9B. Uh, will be taken up at our February meeting on February 5th. And um, if there are no other items, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>